in um, Pedro Calderón de la Barca's play La Vida es Sueño, Life is a Dream, a prisoner wakes up in the cell and he's had a dream that he was once a tyrannical king that ruled with an iron hand. He's able to dismiss this as just a dream, but one thing that he can't let go is that in the dream he loved a woman uh, very much. And that's the part that makes him uncomfortable because it was just a dream, but the feeling is just real. What he doesn't know is that his memory's been erased and he was that terrible person. And he was deeply in love with a, a real woman at one time. His heart uh, was awake uh, as he slept a paraphrase from the Song of Songs in the Old Testament. It's pretty much the case in Solaris, the novel by Stanislaw Sven, which was made into a remarkable uh, Russian film. And that's the cover for the American version. There's this living planet, and there's a satellite orbiting the planet, and it's the uh, scientists on board, when they sleep, their unconscious manifests itself uh, and when they wake and it's that part that never um, is is never part from them and something's just so deep and and for one it's the suicide of his wife and well, it's his wife and who committed suicide and so when he wakes up uh, she is, she's there, and it's how he remembered her, and he realizes that, but she seems so real, and what do you do, it's, do you let go of this, do you, and when he tries, it's, it becomes almost impossible, because um, the way the planet works, as long as you're there, when you sleep, she'll be there again. Um, dreams are something that Jorge Luis Borges was fascinated by, as was Quevedo, Los Sueños, the dreams. And the symbolist poets from the 1890s, like Gustav Klimt. And there's something about uh, artwork and also in comics that you're able to express it in a way where that those type of uh, that part of the imagination is able to manifest itself and there are people who can do it who have the talent or the skill or the brilliance and in some cases the genius to do it um, and in comics you have for example Vittorio Giordino's Little Ego about a young woman's sexual dreams and when she wakes up she's she's on her bed and she wants to have a conversation with a therapist afterwards. They've been brilliantly done by Guido Kripax as Valentina. And um, in the same tradition uh, was the great uh, American artist uh, Winsor McKay uh, whose little Nemo was uh, an influence on Giardino and Prepex and numerous other writers and artists. And um, Fanographics produced these, I think these from the late 80s. And those not familiar with little Nemo, it's uh, about a little boy who is summoned to a place called Slumberland by a man named King Morpheus who wants a playmate for his daughter, the princess. And little Nemo visits this place. And at the end of every strip, he wakes up. But the dreams continue when he goes back to sleep, where he left off. 
and uh, final graphics produces I uh, really well done the print is rather small but uh, the artwork is quite fascinating that's mainly the why you look at Little Nemo they were produced turn of the century published in New York paper I think they come out every Sunday the work is astounding I it continues to impress me my collection is incomplete and uh, the reason I'm doing this video is because uh, a new collection has been published and let me just show it to you here is this <coughs> hefty hefty book it's the uh, the complete little nemo by Winsor McKay by Tasha it's very heavy and it's very big as you can see I'm going to compare it to the panographics Or even with the Fanographics Valentina books, which are quite tall, but, but this is much more. It's before I get to certain parts. Let's see, there we go. It collects the series from 1904, 1905 to 1909. It's just absolutely beautiful. The print is still small, but it's more readable than the fanographics for those of us whose eyes aren't what they used to be. But the colors, the creativity, the Everything about this is just astounding to me whenever I see it. It's just a remarkable piece of work, what McKay did. And he was very much, very much influenced at the generations of artists and writers. And we'll go into that in just a moment. But there's nothing quite like this. And I think the, and these comic strips were read by adults because they were published in the newspaper. And mainly it uh, was mostly for an adult audience. I think at one point, pretty much like fairy tales were pretty much for adults, not for children. But I think this is the way to read these comic strips. I think how the newspapers used to be about a hundred years ago. But one of the great treats of this is that although the book is about right under 400 pages the first 140 pages are a biography of McKay and his times let me go through this McKay revisited the early years on the way to comics little Sammy Sneeze one of his many creations prior to Little Nemo. Rare Bit Nightmares, which are just, I wish these would be compiled. I'll show some in a moment. self reality Dreams, Dreams, Architecture, Editorials and Allegories, Moving Comics, McKay and the War, and the Late Works, and then Little Nemo. So it begins with there's McKay and the large type it, it, it emphasizes the, the Hearst newspapers after William Randolph Hearst who produced a, many sensationalist newspapers and was the basis the inspiration for uh, um, Orson Welles film Citizen Kane and eventually very sensationalist um, um, headlines 
but that's how much of this is. You get a biography of him. He was, his family was from Canada. They moved to Michigan. <laughs> you have stuff again, back to the Hearst influence. I mean, Kay Mary's a 14 year old girl. Um, oh, yes, an early comic strip is Sammy Sneeze. It's about a little boy who had this ability to sneeze, and whenever he did, it, it's, it creates chaos. Uh, dreams of the rarebit fiends. These are typically tend to be nightmares. And uh, I don't know if these have been collected, but these would be nice if they were. And some of them are quite horrifying. But typically they wake, they end with a man um, or the woman waking up from the dream and complaining that it was something they ate. Which reminds me of my college uh, psychology professor who one day kind of like shocked the class when at the end someone asked her something about why do we have certain dreams and she says depends what you ate the night before I like to tease well I've liked to tease over the years my friends who became psychologists or counselors and um, saying that much of their craft is based on what people what restaurant they their clients ate at or their patients ate at they don't seem to like that very much from a case times, you have, um, so you can see, there's the Elephant Man, as he came to be known. Um, but basically, there's this, there's this fascination with, I guess, with freaks or with strange things, and basically the precursor to reality shows, uh, like that, which are dominant now. And of course, now we have, as a result, the reality show president. Um, and let's see, you have more here. More of the artwork here. And there's more of dreams of. Oh, this is wonderful. Dream of the rare bit fiend. And you, there you have this man saying, uh, confessing his love for this woman. But as he's doing this, she begins to break apart. And he says, You are puzzled to me. I don't seem to solve. You are not a riddle, nor a conundrum. You are a puzzle. I'll never put you together. I mean, this psychologically says quite a bit about the human condition. And what I like about this, it goes into, it puts it, McKay's it works in context. And it predates much of Sigmund Freud's work about psychoanalysis. And then there's the idea of hypnosis and hysteria, which were prominent at the time. And here's another dream, a very bit fiend about a man who keeps dreaming that he keeps getting taller. Um, and then he puts them in the context of precursors, like Goya's dreams. Um, the sleep of reason produces monsters. Um, oh yes, Fuseli's beautiful nightmare. Oh, so he puts it in... And there's a re also there the early, early, early films, or talkies as they called them back then. And he puts them as the industry of this tradition, and we Certainly, early moves, early moves of serialism, and then there's a reference there to Terry Gilliam's Brazil, something more, more modern. And this is another horrifying story about a, a man who is having this dream that the devil is upset with him because he stole his pitchfork, which he did not, and then he just tortures him, as you can see. Oh. I mean, before Gaiman did Sandman, I mean, some of these things are um, definitely in the Gaiman tradition. Um, I'm pretty sure that, that Neil is familiar with Nemo since uh, Gaiman is very literary and uh, just reads and absorbs just about everything. Let's see. Again, there's just a massive amount of information in this book. And much of it is the history of the United States in the early 20th century, prior to the Great Depression and prior to the eve of the First World War. Um, the eve of the talkies, or films, silent films. Um, let's see, I'm going to head here. Oh, uh, I know he helped one of the early animated films he made. 
uh, had to do with Lusitania, the sink in Lusitania. Here we go. If I'm correct, his son was in the First World War, as was, I think, his brother-in-law. Then some of the cartoon propaganda work he produced for the Americans. I'm just trying to jump here to find for the influence here to be more good. Oh, I think this is it. This is now we get into his influence into into the popular culture, influence on Disney. And now we get to the contemporary. Here you have a Steve Ditko, Stan Lee story about a man again who's having these dreams. And he wakes up in his bed. Um, Art, uh, an Art Spiegelman story. I think some of the 1950s comics you see here. And something I was not familiar about, Brian Boland, something called Little Nympho from the early 70s. I think 73 is here. And of course, you have um, in Prepactus Valentina, little Nemo at one point appears, and if I'm correct, he helps her wake up from her dream. Uh, Mobius. And there was a movie made, and I that, that was not aware about. And this is something uh, Rare Bit Fiends, which I think are the dreams of Rick Veitch. And you put this comic together. I'm not familiar with it. Here you have um, Calvin Hobbes, another imp. And there's a Batman comic here. Nocturna means nightmare. And you can see that there's little Nemo. Um, he's taken from little Nemo in his bed. And there's little Ego. For instance, Vittorio Giordani's book, which I, you have up there. And for me, it was, that was before I knew Little Nemo, I knew Little Ego. I, something I discovered when I was young. And now that I'm old, I <laughs> discovered Little Nemo. And then you have a lot of end notes. And then we begin with Little Nemo and his first story. When he's visited by man and a horse to go to Slumberland and he travels and his kangaroos but then he falls off and he wake he falls and when he wakes he's falling off his bed but then he wakes next day he has another dream and he travels to this place with mushrooms but when he touches them they all collapse and his father wakes him and says, um, Don't mama tell you not to eat that raisin cake last night. Now go to sleep now. Um, I got this for $20. And it was on Amazon on sale. And I don't know if it still is, but it was quite the bargain. And again, the artwork for the time, and it's just astounding. I mean, I can. This is as modern as anything out there, in my opinion. And the imagination to do this is just remarkable, I think. And if I'm correct, I don't know when Baum wrote his Wizard of Oz stories. I don't know if it was around this time or right before. But there was something certainly in the imagination at the time which produced, which manifested itself in these wonderful strips. So it's Little Nemo by Windsor McKay, produced by Tasha. Thank you for viewing and uh, happy dreaming.